is we were originally planning this, um, we were hoping to invite a few researchers, um, Carrie, John, Patrick, to come and do seminars. But one thing that we realized was that it was highly unlikely for these scholars would ever meet in one place, or that we would encounter them at our own education conferences. Uh, they probably didn't go to the education research or anthropology meetings we were going to, and we didn't go to sociology, economics, or management conferences. And what was more unlikely and what we thought was really problematic, um, being a research center focused on translational or applied research that actually was addressing problems of practice, was the fact that most of us researchers most likely would never go to the, the conferences that career professionals were attending, such as NACE or NCDA or ACTE. Um, and this situation we thought was unfortunate because internships are one of those programs that implicate so many different parties and organizations. It involves so many different interests and agendas. It's one of those bipartisan issues that has widespread acceptance across the political spectrum and it touches upon intellectual problems and issues in a variety of disciplines and you'll see that in today's program. And so the main goal of this meeting um, from our perspective was to forge new networks and communities of practice around internships and improving them for students' experiences in the long term. Um, and I'd love to hear from all of you at the end of the day what you think about this vision and this idea and whether or not you think that forging or creating a new network or community of practice around this issue is worth pursuing in the future. Let's see, in the interest of time, uh, one of the things that I wanted to also briefly talk about is uh, from our perspective, research on internships needs to address and uncover and document uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I think that we are all kind of committed to the idea that internships can be an extremely rich and valuable experience for students. But I think that we all recognize that there are instances where they may fall short of that vision of experiential education. Um, and I just wanted to share a few examples um, of what we can learn from going out in the field and really understanding what's happening out there. Um, and I want to share some examples from a recent trip that I took to China, where I spent two and a half weeks studying internships in one of the largest research universities in that country. And I share these examples because I think they're not dissimilar to some of the challenges that we face in our own system regarding quality and capacity. Um, first, the good. At this university, internships are required in every department, and across the discipline, students must do a reflective piece of writing about their internship experience, which is combined with the internship supervisor's feedback to calculate their grade. Such reflective writing is a really great opportunity for students to evaluate their experience, their own skill sets, and their career goals. And this type of critical reflection, along with feedback from mentors, is an important step in learning and self-discovery for our young people. Second, um, the, I don't want to say bad, but what could use some improvement. In several engineering programs, internships are all the same for every student. A two-week visit to a pre-selected factory in their senior year, where hundreds of students stay in a dormitory with two to three professors. In the factory, employees were assigned to 60 to 70 students who would crowd around their work area and watch them work for two weeks. In conditions very variously described to me as polluted and intolerable, it was essentially a two-week field trip where the, the students just watched someone else operate machinery um, with no opportunity to do themselves. And to add insult to injury, students had to pay half of the rent and Wi-Fi costs for their stay in the dormitory. And then finally, the ugly. Um, when you study internships in China, you cannot escape some of the controversies that have been happening in some of the large-scale factories there. Um, and in some of these factories, many of whom are producing the laptops and smartphones we're using today, uh, some of these factories have up to one-third of their labor force comprised of high school or college interns who are replacing full-time employees who must be paid the expensive Chinese social insurance, um, which is uh, much more expensive than what we, the costs associated with that in the U.S. Instead, vocational colleges are paid by provin provincial governments to send their students to factories with temporary labor shortages, where students are working on factory lines 10 to 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week, doing menial tasks completely unrelated to their education. 
And before we think that such situations could never happen in the U.S., and I think the level of exploitation um, that I just mentioned that's been in the press a lot in East Asia the last few years hopefully would never happen in the U.S., um, I think these problems of un- or poorly paid labor, no meaningful or mentoring or instruction, and work with little connection to students' academic programming um, is not limited to China. And so some of these issues and concerns have really informed the research that we're pursuing, um, and I just wanted to briefly go over this. We weren't ready to present a lot of our data um, at this meeting, and we also wanted to give the floor to some great researchers from around the country. Um, but we've launched the college internship study, and these are some of the questions that we're interested in. And as a team that's com uh, mostly comprised of anthropologists and uh, focused on ethnographic description, we're really interested in documenting how are internships being implemented and experienced at different types of institutions. So I just wanted to share a few data points. So one of the questions we wanted to know was, who is taking an internship? Um, and this is something that we found many institutions don't know the answer to across their institution because of data tracking issues. Um, and you can see here more than half the seniors at Institution A, which is a small HBCU in the South, haven't had an internship. And roughly three quarters have not at Institutions B, which is a, a tech college in Wisconsin and Institution C, which is a medium-sized comprehensive university in Wisconsin. So just in the sample of seniors or people on the cusp of entering their uh, last year of their program. So you can see many students are not engaged in internships at these three institutions. Uh, we also wanted to know for students who did want to take an internship but didn't, what were the barriers to their participation? And so here you can see some data from Institution B, the Wisconsin Technical College, that more than ha half had to work another job. 45% had too many courses, and about 30% had insufficient opportunities in their field or the pay was too low for them to pursue an internship. And then the final piece of data that I'll share, um, and you can see some promising results here, is about satisfaction. How satisfied were students with their internship experience? Um, where more than 65% in each institution were very or extremely satisfied. Um, but there's clearly room for improvement at the lower end of the satisfaction scale. Um, and as part of this project, I'm happy to announce that we'll be administering our online survey on a national basis in the spring of 2019 to any college that's interested. Um, we're hoping to develop a national data set on internships that addresses issues and questions like these. Um, and if you're interested, we have a flyer outside or you can talk to me um, at some point during this uh, symposium.